Okay, so a bit about myself. My name is Jacob Barr. I'm with iRapture.com. I've been working on websites since uh, 2000. I've been focusing on pregnancy centers and um, this, this work um, for about 10 years. Um, and essentially, um, how I got involved in the pregnancy center movement was back in uh, my senior year of high school. There was an acting group that came to my school uh, called Unified Students for Abstinence, the USA team. And they were humorous doing peer-to-peer -peer skits, encouraging their peers to choose abstinence. And um, after they came to my school, I ended up joining that group because it was like a lot of fun. And I ended up doing peer-to-peer -peer skits like Hans and Franz and different skits to encourage uh, young, young, young uh, uh, youth groups and, and school groups to choose abstinence. And so that was sort of my entry into the pregnancy center world um, back in uh, early college days. <clears throat> so I enjoy interruptions and questions. If you want to derail with a question, just raise your hand. I might want to finish my current thought so we don't, I don't lose it, but yet just ask the question. That's, um, I, I really enjoy brainstorming and just simply figuring out uh, things with different input and angles, so feel free to interject. I'm not going to mind at all, and, and I, would, I would appreciate it. And if you don't agree with something, um, feel free to raise your hand. I, I, I enjoy constructive criticism. That's how we get sharper, so feel free to interrupt. So today, I was going to talk about these three things, a new concept, um, a client-facing client Facebook strategy, along with uh, Google at the Google AdWords grant, and then following with the abortion pill reversal network and how it's really important for us to promote and uh, engage with that. So if by chance someone in this room feels that client Facebook marketing is something that they just don't want to miss a thing on, feel free to just let me know and I will talk to just you and the rest of the people in the room can just listen. And then that way we'll have essentially a personal conversation and sort of go about this a bit differently. But if you just want to sort of talk as a group, we can do that too. But sometimes it's nice just to talk one-on-one. -on -one. I almost feel like we all get more something when we just sort of make eye contact and focus in on an exact situation. So if by chance you would like to try that, feel free to let me know. Okay, so this is my only slide for the Facebook strategy. Essentially, this is a list of puzzle pieces that come together to create a strategy for a client-facing Facebook um, marketing concept. Obviously, Facebook has worked well for donors. Well, it has, and a lot of people, a lot of centers have used Facebook for donors. But this is for the client, the abortion-minded client. And a lot of us have seen over, over the last 10 years, I've seen people try a client-facing Facebook strategy, and it doesn't really seem to have much traction, or it's, it doesn't seem to perform with getting clients into the doorway of a counseling room. And so this is something new, and I wouldn't call it proven. I would call it a trailblazing um, effort based on solid principles and reasonably good ideas. Um, <clears throat> so the first item we have here is the problem, the lack of awareness. Um, Mark Newman is a, uh, was at a Heartbeat conference back in 2014, and he shared the uh, results of a, of a survey that essentially showed the, um, he went to college campuses, public and private, and the public college campus, he asked about 12 questions. Question seven, I believe it was, said, if you were, uh, if you, if someone with an unplanned pregnancy came to you, where would you refer them? And 51% said Plant Parenthood, 45% said, I don't know, and only about 5% said the local pregnancy center. And essentially what that meant is that we have a major, at least at that college, those college campuses that he did his survey, we have a major lack of awareness problem on the college campus. Um, when he did the same exact survey at a private slash Christian college campus, it, the highest number was, I don't know, 
The second number was Planned Parenthood. And then the third, coming in at 10%, was the local PRC. And again, that, again it, it's not that we're, we have a lack of pro-life people at a Christian campus. It's that we have a lack of awareness of the local PRC as being a solution. So that's the first puzzle piece um, in our roadmap here. <clears throat> okay, so the next piece, oh, and actually at the last Heartbeat Conference this year, he shared uh, additional survey results, and they actually ended up being lower than the 2014 number. So it's actually gone down on awareness. And I don't know, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure which college campuses he went to, or if he went to different ones or new ones, but he, essentially he's going, it's an ongoing effort on his part. And if anyone would like a copy of the survey results from 2014, um, I have them. I can just email me, and I can email you a scan that he gave me in 2014 as a handout when I was in his workshop. Jake, do you know if those, do you know whether they were West Coast, West Coast? I mean, generally speaking, I can give you a copy of the survey okay. handout. I don't know what co what campus, okay. um, but essentially there were several questions. That was the one question that that's the only question I really honed in on for this solution. Um, but there are several other questions, just like how many abortions happen annually. They had other abortion type questions on there just to sort of help people understand, you know, what do people think of, of, of abortion? Okay, so the intake form results. Um, who in here is a pregnancy center director? Okay, uh, who in here knows of who's tied to a center or works at a center in here? Okay, of those that are at a center, do you know your intake form? Like, you know, the number one and number two results for how people come in to your center, like word of mouth. Word of mouth. Yeah. Is word of mouth number one for you? Yeah. Does yeah. that include by a friend and a professional? No, professional and, and friends. Okay, because yeah. sometimes they're, they're tracked as two different numbers, by, or sometimes they're grouped together by a friend and professional. But usually word of mouth, uh, effectively speaking, across the country is number one mostly. However, Google slash internet, not necessarily a website, but Google slash internet is competing for that number one spot. And, and it's very, it usually it's number two, or I've actually seen it in a few centers where it's actually number one now, word of mouth is following number two, but it depends on the, on the area. Um, nonetheless, I would say effectively speaking, word of mouth is the number one vehicle for why women come into a center overall over the country. Um, not to say that that's the case everywhere. Um, so, if we take the problem, the lack of awareness, and we combine it with our top performing vehicle, that leads us to this third piece, which is the opportunity. If we were to increase the awareness, then it would just be like common sense. Like it's sort of like just a light bulb going off of, then that would, um, if we increase awareness, and it gives me goosebumps because it's such an awesome you know, if we increase awareness, then we'll, increase, we'll, we'll empower, we'll increase our top performing vehicle. We'll give it more traction. If twice as many people are aware, then we may actually get twice as much word of mouth. Instead of, you know, it's sort of like finding the best vehicle and just simply giving it better, you know, giving it better traction. Um, okay, so that is sort of like the premise of our Facebook strategy that we're leading up to. So the next piece is the geographic scope of Facebook ads. Um, okay, so let's say for example, this is the Google map pen where your center is. And let's say you actually have two centers, so why not? And with your center, uh, Facebook, uh, YouTube, Google, these online marketing vehicles allow you to actually draw a radius around your map pen, and you can advertise to those within that radius. And if, whether the radius is five miles, 10 miles, 50 miles, if you're extra rural, <laughs> you know? Like in, like in um, California, it may be a 10 mile circle, and that 10 mile circle around your centers adds up to 2.2 .2 million, <laughs> you know? But if you're rural, you may have a 50 mile circle, and it may be a lot less. It depends on how far your clients drive and one uh, interesting thought is, you know, you might have your city here, but you may include the neighboring city because sometimes people want to drive to a neighboring city to go, you know, you might want to advertise beyond your city in case someone doesn't want to go to the local center because it's very, very small town. Everyone knows everybody. 
So having the neighboring town would make a lot of sense. However, regardless of how much radius that is, this tool allows you to advertise around your address, which is a nice puzzle piece in our, in our strategy here. Now, the next piece, demographic scope. This is sort of where this strategy is different than previous Facebook strategies that I've seen people try and, or talk about. So let's say this is, actually, sorry, let me uh, <laughs> fix my camera so they can, I told a lady I would send her a copy that she couldn't stay. Okay, so let's say um, this is the young lady who we would like to uh, reach. And this is her in all of her demographics. She's a woman between, between the ages of 16 to 24. Uh, maybe in your area she's white or Hispanic or black or Asian based on the percentages. Or maybe she's um, in college, maybe she's not in college. You know, Whatever that is, it doesn't really matter to me in this scenario, but this is her. And then the interesting part about this geographic scope is I'm mostly interested in the people that she talks to. I'm interested in the people that actually provide word of mouth. So like when word of mouth, when this lady comes in and she fills out that intake form and she says, I heard about it from a friend, that friend is the reason why she came in. Or if she heard about it from a professional, the doctor, the nurse, that's the, why she, that's the reason why she came in. So this school nurse is the reason why she came in. This parent, this uh, sibling, uh, this uh, classmate, these, you know, the grandparent, the, the youth leader at her church, um, the neighbor, these are the people that, the reason why she came in. <coughs> Excuse me. And so the geographic scope, I would actually say, because of Facebook, you know, 13 plus or whatever the low end is, because we want to reach her siblings and classmates all the way maybe to 50 something. You know, essentially whoever she's talking to that would be influential in her life, which is going to be greater than her sphere. And so I would say these are the people we want to reach with this Facebook strategy. We want to reach them with awareness that you exist, where you are, and we're gonna to get to sort of how that works with this next piece, which is the Facebook funnel. Um, so just out of curiosity, how many people have heard of a of funnel marketing before? Two, okay, cool. So for those of you who haven't heard, I'm really glad you're here <laughs> because Facebook funnel marketing is a very interesting concept and it applies to Facebook and it could be, also be applied to uh, Google Ads possibly a bit, or YouTube. So it's, it's more than just Facebook, but it works really well with Facebook. So let's pretend this is our pool of people, and I'm gonna draw a funnel below. And in my funnel, I'm gonna give it um, three tiers, just as an example. So I'm gonna run an ad to everyone inside of this sphere and this sphere, and I'm gonna call this ad campaign awareness. Essentially, I'm trying to imagine a, um, uh, a set of a flight of stairs. I'm trying to have someone go to, you know, I'm trying to help someone identify that they're on the, the step that they are. I'm trying to identify where they are and get them ready to take that very first step in a journal, a, you know, a, a journey of many steps. And so this very first step of awareness, I want someone, I want to try and have an ad that's it doesn't have a call to action. It doesn't encourage someone to come in for an appointment. It actually all, it, it's, it's a, essentially it's, a, it's a, um, a way of saying, we provide services for women who have an unplanned pregnancy. <laughs> you know, this is a place that provides services for someone with an unplanned pregnancy, saying that with video, saying that with a storyline that is intriguing, it keeps someone's attention, and it doesn't, because the person that's gonna see this might be the parent, the nurse, the school classmate. The, the woman in the middle will be included. And the idea is that we just want her to know that you exist where you are, and, and, and that's, that's it. We're not, trying to, we're not trying to have them respond with a call to action. And I would say this is a great opportunity to use a, a video for that first ad. With Facebook, if you show, use a video as your first ad, you can actually measure what percent of people watch um, the video. So let's say, for example, 
Um, I have this video on, on Facebook. I use it to advertise. And this is going well beyond like the residential, you know, the personal advertising. This is called business advertising on Facebook, which is you get a great deal more tools. But essentially, if you go to business.facebook.com, you can convert your normal page into a business page and you get a host of new features and advertising tools. Um, and in using some of these tools, it does take um, expertise. So I would encourage you to reach out to someone who can help guide you. Maybe, and it doesn't have to be someone in the printing center world. It could be someone who helps you know, sell, sell pottery. It could be a business group who is an expert group on advertising on Facebook. And you can apply that expert business knowledge to the pregnancy center work that you're doing with this Facebook funnel. And that's actually how I found this funnel and this concept was through a business group that I was attending for, the, for about seven months. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so let's say everyone that watches this, this video, 75% or more, we would then send them the next ad based on the fact that they watched the video and sort of met a certain threshold. And so this next ad may be as simple as a positive story, trying to essentially take the awareness and show um, a story of success. Or maybe it's the fact that we provide free ultrasounds and that's a positive story. Um, and these tiers are not set. You know, this is part of the trailblazing effort is figuring out what these need to be. And this third tier, you know, at this point, I would say it's a question mark because there's a lot of options. And the question mark would also apply to the first tiers because these, this is um, a tool that can be used to build all sorts of different campaigns. This funnel marketing concept is a big, important tool and uh, just take some time to let it soak in on how, how awesome and effective this can be. <clears throat> okay. Jacob? Yes. So on, on that first level, you said the awareness. Then you, did you say on that second one that you specifically send that video or that information to those that were responding to the awareness? Is that? So, yes. So say, for, and actually, um, so though, uh, essentially a custom audience group. Um, so like everyone inside of this sphere and, an, and inside of this sphere, I can make what's called a custom audience group, which means the only attribute is that they're in this location. And then I can say, well, anyone in that location and anyone that watched 85% or more of these videos, now I've got a custom audience group uh, based on location and the fact that they watched this one video and I can send them this set of ads. And so that's, you know, you can essentially make your own checklist. Like the custom audience group, it's custom. You can, you know, location and they watched my ad and they went to my website. There's a thing called a Facebook pixel where if you put a bit of code on your website and that that person uses that same computer or device, Facebook will capture them and put them into a custom audience group, meaning they went to your website and were captured by the Facebook pixel. And you can advertise to them, but that doesn't really come into this play, but that's, you'll hear a lot about the Facebook pixel, and that's, a, that's another use of a custom audience group. Um, but I think it's really, yes, please. Um, we, our center's in a pretty rural area, we're in northern Missouri, and so when we've done targeting, when we try to focus beyond just like women in this age group, it says our audience is too small. Yeah. Once we start cutting that down, you're getting down to that That may, yeah, and I haven't. I don't have a solution for that. <laughs> um, yeah. So this, yeah. But the next, the next two parts of our present, my presentation, may be help, more help applicable. <laughs> um, okay. So then the Facebook use model. Um, when someone is using Facebook, and just think of how you use Facebook. I, th I think a lot of us use it sort of in the same way. We just sort of browse, we're meandering. We're not necessarily going there to find a certain piece of information. We actually, we're just sort of going there to check in and see what's going on with friends, family, and what's new because I've got 10 minutes to spare. Mm -hmm. um, the alternative to that, just to give some contrast, would be the way someone uses Google. So when you go to Google, you don't just browse for like what's new. You sort of look for a phone number for a certain place. You look for a certain store based on its zip, its zip code and name. I mean, you're, it's very targeted. Whereas Facebook is just sort of like, let's go to the mall and walk around <laughs> and see what's there. It's the complete, yeah. 
It's, yeah. Um, so but anyways, the, the, the way the Facebook use model, I would say, is a prime example of bringing new ideas to a group because they're meandering, looking for something that catches their eye. And so your content, you know, this video needs to be, there's a difference between a, a video that works and a video that doesn't work. And so there's, you know, you, you could use a, a, a great video that's eye-catching and really helps people engage and stay, stay with the video for the whole 75% or more. Or you could also have a video where they drop off really quick. And I've done videos where both happens. You know, we've had, you know, so it's not necessarily the vehicle, it's more the, the video and its ability to capture and engage the audience. Um, and so that's a, that's a key Im important piece is that you need to have excellent content and you can measure the content because you, you can see um, when people drop off, how many people drop off, at what point, they, you know, at five seconds I've only got 50% and then at 10 seconds they've all dropped off. Or, you know, I had 85% stay all the way until the end. Um, we've seen both examples and there's lots of data. So this business model on Facebook gives you a lot of data based on how people, how people see and interact with your content. Can you track that? Yes, we, Facebook does it for you. By just simply using Facebook, you can look at all the stats based on how that, um, and even if it's a, simply a Facebook video that you post organically, you can see the data on how people used it. How do you get to that? Business.facebook.com. It's a whole new, it's, we could do a 10 hour presentation on face business stuff. It, essentially, it's very, very in depth. Like it requires an educational level of research. <laughs> you know, like you could take a college course on business.facebook.com and it would be an interesting class. <laughs> um, but just know that it exists and that you need to sort of partner and, and do, it's gonna take some time to go, it has a learning curve and it's gonna be, it's gonna be daunting at the beginning, but it's worthwhile to work through. Um, okay, so the next piece is cost strategy with the local Facebook content. So the way Facebook works is if you stay on Facebook, Facebook makes money because as you interact with people's ads, as you view their videos, they're making money constantly, like a penny per view for some videos or more. But um, so like if you have your video and you upload it as a Facebook post, and use that as your ad. And when someone sees your ad, they're on Facebook. They don't have to leave and go to YouTube or leave and go to your website. Essentially the cost per three second view, we've seen it at between one tenth of a penny all the way to three cents in that ballpark range. And so it's very low cost. In comparison, if you have someone go to YouTube or your website, you may be paying 30 cents per three second, view, you know, for essentially per click. And so it's cheaper to keep someone on Facebook because then Facebook gets to continue to make money as they continue to browse more videos and you know, interact with the content. So Google, I mean, uh, Facebook has a financial incentive to keep people on Facebook so they can charge a lot less when people stay on Facebook. So how, essentially when I say local Facebook content, that just means you have to upload the video to Facebook and you show the Facebook content as your ad, more so than driving someone off, you know, into a different website. Does that make sense? Okay. So anyways, essentially, yeah, cost strategy, another, another, another puzzle piece. And how to measure results. Now this one is an offline piece. So, and this one um, is somewhat untested for myself, but based off of the Mark Newman survey, I think a reasonable approach to how to measure results would be to go to a, a college campus or go to where you're advertising and take a poll of people in the area and ask them questions, just like how Mark Newman did with his 12 question survey. And the one question about if, you, if someone uh, you knew or so, you know, if someone asked you um, where they should go if they had an unplanned pregnancy, that answer will give you insight as to um, the community's response to that position. And whether they say Planned Parenthood or I don't know or local PRC or they may say the hospital or go to the ER or talk to your mom, um, all of those, you know, whatever the answers might be, that's going to be how you can measure where you are today. And then if you spend <clears throat> a large amount of money, energy, and time trying to raise awareness, you could repeat that poll and see what difference you made. Because the poll, uh, and I believe the poll is the, the a reasonable way to do this because 
the number of women that come through your doorways into the counseling room may not be impacted immediately by this strategy because when someone um, learns about you and has a positive story, it doesn't mean that they're going to know someone with an unplanned pregnancy this month. They may, they, you know, that, that may be something they get to share in 10 months or whenever that day comes. Um, but essentially we want people to know before their, you know, before their opportunity to share comes up. And so I would say measuring the results is better with a poll because it may be more of a trickle um, when it comes to the intake, the intake forms coming, you know, increasing, you know, that word of mouth number may not be impacted immediately. It may be more subtle. Um, and so, yeah, so this is the Facebook strategy for clients. It's a trailblazing effort where, you know, um, I'm sure there's plenty of rocks in the road that still need to be kicked and cleared out. <laughs> um, and so what are your thoughts? What are your um, questions or comments? Sounds complicated. Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I think just getting like the base of where you're at to start off will probably be like the most difficult and then you can jump start it from there. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know, you know, our town's small. I would think everybody would know, who, you know, but I'm sure they don't now that I think about it, you know, because I do run into those people like, how have you never heard? Of the door, you know, so if you take a poll, it's also sort of self-correcting, meaning right. in, in the end, you get to say who you are and what you do. Right. <laughs> so if you take a poll of 100 people, 100 people are going to know who you are at the end. So if you take <laughs> out and ask you know, the same question throughout the town or you know, your area, and then yeah. start from there. Um, essentially, I would, I would summarize this as advertising to people, using Facebook to advertise to people that don't know you yet. Right. More so than using, so normally we, people use Facebook to engage with people they do know. But advertising is to connect with people that you don't know or don't know you in order to bring awareness. And it's almost like a relationship. We're trying to start off at hello, and then we have small talk. And then eventually we get to have a personal conversation. But the personal conversation comes many steps in. I mean, small talk has a purpose. I mean, obviously at church, we all hate it. <laughs> but that's because you should be much further down the relationship pipe, right? But, uh, but here, small talk is great. Yeah, so hello, small talk, and eventually we get to have conversations and get to know each other. And maybe broaden to your advertising too, because like you said, you're, gonna, you're trying to get everyone yeah. they're talking to. So, we're not, yeah, so normally the Facebook talk. strategies would target the, the lady who is in search of help when she needs it. Right. So this is targeting everybody that talks to her before she needs it. And so it's, it's normally in marketing, you want to say, I want to talk to this small, specific, unique uh, niche group. Well, in this case, I'm breaking that rule by saying we want everyone to know we exist. <laughs> yes. That's kind of where I was going with this, actually, is it's overwhelming because basically anybody could be a referral source. Mm -hmm. I mean, your personal sphere of influence includes personal and professional contacts from right. uh, just across a variety of strata. So it seems to me like but Facebook. actually, well, like my thought was, okay, you're, <coughs> I, I'm an adoption agency, okay. pregnancy resource centers, wouldn't it make more sense to, before you start that awareness campaign, identify who's most likely to refer to you? So, you know, your local OBGYN or your local um, social service agency, DSS or, or, or whoever, and then not target exactly the way you would on Facebook, but target your awareness campaign somewhat. Um, Otherwise, it's, it just seems like the, the so let me give you a of the metrics. So in, um, we were working on a con this concept with a group near um, San Francisco, and it essentially they have four locations, and within a, a 15-mile radius, there was 2.2 .2 million people. And with a ten dollar per bu a ten dollar budget per day, we reached thirty thousand people over the course of about five months, and we're you know we're still in level A, but essentially it's um, it's a low cost option to bring awareness to because you don't know where that referral is going to come from. This this you know this young but young lady. Does that, like, does that translate though to the rural? I do, I don't know. I mean, because well, so you'd have to yeah, that's a puzzle piece I have not figured out to yet. Get, to get three million people. 30,000. 37,000, sorry. Yeah. I was projecting out. <laughs> 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 to get 30,000 people in five months if you are in Parksville, yeah. I mean, 
mean, that's like a three-state. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, you're, ta you're talking northern Missouri, Iowa. Yeah. You know. Well, it's on Facebook every day. Yeah. And for us, it's like 5,000 and 6,000. Right, yeah. Like, you um, have to yeah, so adjust your... Well, we have most of our referrals come from a friend for our girls, and so it's not a doctor or a social service or anything. It's a person... In that same yeah, it's a personal it, connection. So you so could you target, target a. Yeah, so you target. Yeah, you could target <coughs> like eighteen to twenty-five or something the, like that. The client group. You could target the yeah the, the the classmate age or the siblings age. Yeah. See, well, in our area, though, we have a lot of elderly people that take care of their grandkids. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so those kids are getting up in high school where yeah. you know they need help. They're looking to their grandparents who might not know that we exist mm -hmm. because we never targeted that. So then yeah. you target fifty and up. Well, right? yeah, and I, I was thinking fifty was a top, but maybe it's. Maybe it's not a top. I mean, honestly, the, the geographic scope is a pretty good confinement of reducing how many people you're trying to reach. And actually, in the rural, you don't even have enough people. So we don't really need to worry about having too many people because we don't have enough to even do the... I mean, so I would look into this, but you do need to have enough people for them to... Um, actually, I, don't know, I haven't tried it in a rural area. So it may be different with business.facebook than it is with normal ads. Um, well, that's what I was wondering. Would you account by geography and just broaden your geographic area at that point? Yeah, I don't know. For us, I mean, we go, you go 30 miles every direction and there's not enough. Yeah, like, and, and like a good question might be, so if you look at your clients, how far, mm -hmm. do, you know, how far does someone drive to come to your clinic? Uh, what's, what's the max range like, you know, of the top 3% that drove the most? Mm -hmm. How far was it? And that, that, that should be, you know, the 3% would be probably your borderline of how far you want to advertise, if not a bit more. Okay, so um, I'm going to go on to the next slide. How are we doing on time? Should be good. Okay. Yeah. We've got two more sections. You got about 41 minutes. Oh, perfect. That's good. Okay, so um, if anyone, well, it's a small group. Last time I did this, I had a li little bit bigger group. So if anyone has, an, you know, this is about the Google AdWords grant. And so who in here um, has the Google AdWords grant? Okay. Um, who in here has a nonprofit with an EIN number and does not have a Google AdWords grant? All right, so this is for you. <laughs> so a Google AdWords grant is for 10,000 Google dollars, not cash US dollars, per month. <laughs> um, and that's per month. It's sort of the same exchange rate you would play with Monopoly. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Advertising dollars, but however, you don't have to pay. there's a whole side story when someone steals your account and uses it fraudulently to advertise their business and what kind of legal repercussions can come from that 10,000 monopoly dollars per month. Oh. It doesn't translate into U.S. <laughs> but nonetheless, there, there's, I, I haven't figured out what that translation, it's, it's worthwhile. <laughs> okay, um, so that's what it is. Who in here knows what a Google ad, actually, um, let me just lay it out real quick. So this is my search result page. Um, and, and over here in the very top, I might have three ads if it's not too rural. <laughs> you know, if, there's, if it's rural, I may not have any ads. And then I may have a, uh, a map section with a few local listings based off of addresses. And then I may have, um, on this page, there'll be essentially about 10 organic searches results. And then I may have a few more ads, and then I may have a few more ads. Uh, essentially, with very competitive markets, there'll be a lot of ads on a given phrase, and less competitive smaller markets or less competitive phrases, there may not be any ads. Um, and uh, whether that's because there's no one advertising or because there's just none of the search volume to show ads, one or the other. Um, but essentially, what we're trying to talk about is this, you know, the ad section. Essentially, it says ad, and then it has a listing. That's what we're talking about here. And usually, it's got a different colored background. Um, and so this grant allows you to have, to advertise and make, I can't make campaigns and make ad groups in order to advertise the content on your website. Not necessarily the, con you know, you can't just advertise a phrase like um, mifepristone and talk about it with some marketing content and having a list of keywords with a landing page that goes to your site that doesn't talk about Mifepristone because Google would mark that as being a low relevant result. And so if you have a page that talks about 
are you 46 and the abortion pill, then you can have an article, you know, an article that includes mifepristone because it's in the article and the article text needs to be, the article text, I mean, I mean not the article text, the, um, the, the ad text and the ad words and the content on your page need to all be coherently on the same thought. Um, and Google does use what's called broad match, which means if you were to have a page about pregnancy tests and you had your ad about pregnancy tests, you could have a list of keywords that goes a little bit beyond pregnancy tests, but it's sort of like in the sphere of the pregnancy test world. Like for example, free pregnancy tests, medical pregnancy tests, um, early pregnancy tests, uh, medical grade pregnancy tests. And it, there's, essentially the word pregnancy test has about 500 phrases that you know, encompass adjectives and different ways of saying it based on how people search. And so that's called broad match. Um, and so you could actually just have the phrase pregnancy test as your, your, at, your, your keyword, but it could also then sort of run into um, synonymous phrases and synonymous words. Would Google do that for you, or is that something you have to enter? Like you have to it can do it for you, but you can also enter in additional phrases. And I, and I don't really have a way of measuring how far they go with the broad match, but you, there's no harm. You can essentially add 10,000 phrases per ad group, and we learned that. <laughs> Most of our ad groups only have 25 phrases because we, when we were making long lists of phrases, we didn't know about broad match. <laughs> so that saved us a lot of time. Jake, isn't it? Everybody I talk to, when they do a search on Google and they see something that comes up that says ad, they skip it? They don't look at it. Yeah. And then you don't have to pay for it with the ad money. But whenever someone clicks on it, that's when you have to pay. Yeah. You, get, you get dinged. What you bid. So I would say the organics is where most people go. Actually, the local and the organics is the, t the most preferred place to be. But people do click on the ads. Um, otherwise, this grant wouldn't have all the stats saying that you know, this center in uh, Orange County spent $6,000 last month on their ads, meaning 3,000 or more people clicked on those ads. Like, to me, an ad is less, I, I, you know, organic is much better, but people still click on the ads. So there's, you know, why not be in all three spots, organic, local, and in the ad section? Um, yes. And it does show up at the top. Yeah, right. Yeah. So it's awareness, perhaps. <laughs> Even if they don't click on it. Even if they don't click on it. But yeah. it seems like a lot of people avoid those. And I'm thinking in a rural area like Clinton, mm -hmm. where we're at, or Kirksville. I wonder the relevancy. I wonder if your stuff would even come up. I mean, we get quite a few Do you? clicks. On, I mean, not, some of the main ones that we get are on things a little more like pregnancy symptoms or yeah. like, you know, referring to our pregnancy yeah. myth. Mm -hmm. So, um, one thing I want to go over is, is essentially as a hurdle that we had to um, figure out. So, um, <laughs> thank you for saying that. <laughs> so the hurdle, this is a fun one. So um, there's a checkbox on the application page. And literally, it's a square. <laughs> and this checkbox was challenging to click, literally. Like, because next to it, it said, we will not discriminate against people who, um, based on their sexual identity or gender, no, um, gender identity or sexual orientation. orientation. <laughs> yeah. So we, yeah, we, oh, in our hiring practices. We will not, yeah, we'll not discriminate against these two groups in our hiring practices. And so this is interesting checkbox to check in the application because as organizations, you I bet 90, 90, 80, 90, 80 to 90% of you are set up as religious organizations because you want to have religious freedom in your hiring practice. It's just like a, like a church would have in hiring a pastor, so you can hire someone based on the beliefs of that person because they're expressing that every day in the counseling room. And if you hire someone who has contrary beliefs, they're going to have a hard time. Yeah, so long story short is you're religious, and you have religious freedom, and this would be counter to that religious freedom. However, that we, I, I, initially I was thinking that religious freedom would trump or you know, supersede this checkbox. So we, uh, essentially we sent off an e-letter talking about you know, the grant and we had a few people come back to us and say, we can't do it because of that checkbox. 
And so we went to NIFLA and asked for some advice. And, they, and Ann O'Connor told me, if you add the word illegally in front of the word, so we will not illegally discriminate against these two groups in our hiring practices, then we could agree to it. And then she came back a little bit later and said, okay, let's change it to unlawfully. That's a little bit stronger than illegally. <laughs> it sounds fine to me. <laughs> so, so yeah, we will not unlawfully discriminate against these two groups um, in our hiring practices. So then I went to Google and I called Google and said, how do we modify this statement on the application? They said, well, we can't modify it for just one organization. But then she essentially gave me a route and I recorded my phone call so that I could have a track record because I knew this was going to be helpful. Um, and essentially, she said if we publish the modified statement on our website, then Google during the application process will um, read everything on our website. And at first I was thinking, how are they going to read every word on our website? Oh, then I realized it's Google and they read every word on our website every day. <laughs> Sometimes three or four times a day. Um, they also work with people in India based on their accents. So essentially, they can read every bit of content. So we make evidence of the content uh, of this modified statement on the website so that when we apply, we now have a, uh, a pathway. Oh, and then I went back to Ann and Tom with NIFLA and said, here's what Google said. We, you know, what do you think? And they essentially said, let's go for it. And then we talked to them some more and they're on board with the idea still after reevaluating it because it's a little bit like, <laughs> it, wasn't a, it wasn't just an easy yes for them to agree to this concept, but essentially we have uh, the word provided by NIFLA. We have the video of the Google rep saying, here's how you, we can um, provide a modified statement. And then NIFLA essentially said, that sounds good, let's go forward. And so that is the major content driven, I mean, the major application hurdle that we've experienced and how we got around or over that hurdle. Um, another hurdle was I went to a, it was at a CareNet conference, I believe, and it, I was in a workshop about the AdWords grant. And one of the, the person, you know, essentially someone had said only about half of the grants uh, go through. And just so you know, really, they all should go through. It's just a matter of having someone with enough grit and like, I don't give upness to push it all the way through. It only takes two hours to get the grant set up if you don't have a grant already, which then it takes 20 hours because we have to realize, we have to figure out what you had done, what someone had done before. <laughs> but if the grant has not been set up, it's a two hour sprint. I mean, it's two hours over two weeks um, and then it's done and set up and ready for use. Um, but if someone had set up your, you know, we had one, or one last week, we had an organization that had already had the grant. They had no clue, but apparently someone set it up and they set it up poorly. And they had, not only did they have the grant that they didn't know about, but they were suspended because they had done it incorrectly. And that was a 20 hour ordeal because that was a lot of work to find stuff, you know, to find information that we didn't have any clue that it existed. No one knew about it, but we ended up figuring it out because we had enough grit to <laughs> never give up. Um, and uh, okay, so anyway, that's the application hurdle, and the con. Okay, so essentially, this you know, before the grant, people would have zero dollars or one hundred and fifty dollars or something per month to spend on on ads. Well, now that you have ten thousand dollars, and you you know, you only have a small amount of people in your area, you have to make more content. So, let's say. Um, your website doesn't have any content on abortion pill reversal, or you know, which would include like mifepristone, uh, misopri you know, these different scientific uh, medical terms. Um, that you can't have if you don't have a page on that, then that means you can't advertise on those words in that in that, in that sphere. But and so essentially, this is essentially encouraging centers to write content, expert content that's high quality on the topics that you are the expert on, and then you can amplify that content through the Google AdWords grant by having, it, having more people see it. Because when you write that content organically, you'll start to show up in the organic search results. And then you can advertise and start showing up in the pay-per-click ad section as well. 
And so, and there's a lot of articles and a lot of words that centers don't, haven't championed yet. Like if you were to look at what you've championed so far and, and you start to actually do content strategy work to figure out what we haven't championed yet, you're gonna realize that that's a, there's plenty of opportunities to increase the number of words you can target. There's a lot of words and every word can have different angles and different ways and you have to write the content so that is for your target audience for her to, her to appreciate and you need to essentially include the words to use in the grant, but yet you want to write it for her. It's always about the person reading the content to encourage her to, you know, you want, you always, you're writing it for the audience. You don't write it for Google. If you write it for Google, you'll have a, people will have a poor user experience and they'll bounce and go back to Google because it, your site will look spammy and keyword stuff. And that's a poor situation for you and for Google. Uh, you want people to have a good experience with your content and site. <coughs> So content driven campaigns, I would encourage each of you to try and write, I always think a reasonable um, plan would be one article per month for your client website. If you are courageous or rich or <laughs> you could try and do one per week or two, you know, two per month. Or if you're poor and overworked and you already have seven hats, then one every three months. But you know, essentially have a plan to write content. And this is, um, um, the, you know, the, the, uh, the, re, uh, the person who can write this content is someone who is a journalist, an editor, a writer, a creative person. Um, it's, it's content. It's, you know, it's a, it's a very, very important job to do. Okay. Any questions, comments? Content, yes. You're oh, I'm sorry. It might be the same question. So <laughs> content, could it be a blog? Yes, and a blog or is a. Does it have to be separate pages? I, I a blog is perfect. Website organization. When you're talking about user experience, if you go and there's like 500 links and it's all text links, then I just go. But, but if it's a yeah. let's say it's a blog, and if someone clicks on that ad, it would go to that article, that exact page within a blog of so 12 you have, plus. You have to make sure that within your blog article, there's a really clear call to action. Yes. Yeah, so every every single blog article. Um, that last paragraph may end up feeling very similar across your, you know, we would love to talk to you about the abortion pill reversal. Um, we're here for you 24 seven, call this number. You know, that last paragraph in your article may feel to you like you're saying the same thing again and again, but if the person that's reading it for the first time, this is the first time they've read that call to action piece at the end. <clears throat> Essentially an article should, should include, um, uh, qu quote. So like, let's say I'm the journalist. I'm going to go to your center and interview your nurse manager and pull some quotes. So I'll, 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 you know, put her in the article under quotes and I'll put her name and her position and title and treat it sort of like a professional article. Um, and then I may end up, um, you know, so essentially it, it needs to be treated. You want to essentially treat your staff as experts so that they're looked at as experts when someone reads this content, medical experts. And the call to action is essentially what should provide like this pathway for someone to guide them to the desired business objective, which is to have them walk through the counseling room um, and begin that conversation with the counselor to continue on. Any more questions? Yes. You talked about pulling different keywords and stuff. How do you go about figuring out what those are going to be? I mean, sure. Like so there's um, a couple tools. One is brainstorming, just brainstorming with your staff and team. And you want to get them. There's a book called uh, Content Strategy for the Web by Christina Halverson. It's an excellent read. Content. I would encourage you to pick up a copy. And it's going to encourage you to get your whole team involved. This is not just a one-man band kind of experience. You want everyone who's a stakeholder to be engaged in your content. There's two editions. The second edition is the current one. Uh, Christina. And if you like, um, she's, a, she's a really good writer. <laughs> she writes about writing. <laughs> so it's a good read. And it's sort of like a, a recipe book for someone who wants to do content work and do it well. Um, so yeah, I would encourage you to pick up a copy of that book to figure out. And this is sort of, this won't tell you which words to use, but this will sort of give you the, the structure to have your team get excited about the importance of content and how content needs to be um, for your audience and needs to have the right pieces and it needs to be um, 
trimmed and pruned and watered and treated with care and, and looked at every six months and audited. There's lots of pieces that co were content. We've sort of, we've been too relaxed. Um, What's her last name? Christina Halverson, H-A-L-V-O-R-S-O-N. If you just Google um, content strategy for the web second edition, it's on Amazon, like 27 bucks. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, okay, we're going back to your word question. So you know, brainstorming. So like, let's say I wrote down all the words up here that you, you know, you have a big whiteboard, start writing words, draw lines, write related words. Um, you can do that same exact concept with your audiences because you know, just how we're trying to identify this girl and her sphere of influences, you could draw, you know, who is this girl? We could zoom in and try and figure out, you know, which scenarios and, you know, who is this audience and how can we sort of identify which words she might be coming to us with. Maybe it's sexual integrity, um, parenthood, fatherhood, because there's insurance needs. It could be um, STI testing. There's going to be a host of phrases and words, and some of which you'll be providing services with, and some of them you'll be providing referrals. And you could look at your services and try and expand which words are connected. There's also some tools by Google. Um, if you do a search on Google for Google Trends, you can sort of help. It's a tool for identifying how words are trending up or down over time. There's also a tool within Google AdWords that allows you to put in a phrase or a website and try and find the words. You can see how much traffic each word has. Um, however, I don't know if it's locally, uh, if it's applied locally in your area or if it's simply applied nationally. I, it's, I forget how that part works, but there's tools within Google. Um, if by chance you need help picking out words, feel free to contact me because I've done this a few times and I can give you either an example of a previous word mapping or I could give you the tools and links so you can start working out yourself and I enjoy this kind of stuff, so I'll spend an hour just resharing it. <laughs> um, okay, any other questions, comments, funny quotes? <laughs> All right. And we, we have 20 minutes left, or? Okay. Well, this last part's my least intense part. Okay, so the abortion pill reversal. So um, the reason why I've included this in my presentation, because this is not necessarily a mark, well, a traditional marketing tool, but I, I would say, uh, so who in here um, is aware of, the a of APR? Most of you? I, okay. So uh, who, who in here, if your center is, is anyone here not connected with APR or you are connected? Um, <laughs> That's a hard question to answer. I asked it both ways. So, are, are you co uh, connected or not connected, or have you had anyone ask for a, a you know, say, I've taken the abortion pill and I've changed my mind. What can I do? Has anyone had that scenario as of yet? No. Okay. Um, and it might be because there's a either there's a lack of people taking the abortion pill, or there's a lack of awareness, and that may be why you haven't heard that as of yet. Um, so essentially what the abortion pill reversal is, is when someone takes the abortion pill, are you 46 in like week six of their pregnancy, <coughs> they, if they take that abortion pill and they decide they changed their mind, within 72 hours they can start the reversal process, the treatment process, and have a 65% chance of reversing uh, or having a baby and if they only took the first abortion pill and not the second yet, there's no, ad there's no added birth defect rate. If they took that second abortion pill, which is to expel the baby, then the birth defect rate goes from like the 2.5% we all have to about 5%. But the reversal treatment does not add any birth defect, does not increase the birth defect rate. It's actually that second abortion pill that expels. Um, and so I, I, as abortion becomes... Uh, more illegal, the, um, the abortion pill may become more prevalent until abortion becomes unthinkable. Um, and some of the, so at the last Heartbeat Conference, there was an international day or international like time of sharing where they had like a, 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 someone from this country would come up and share for three minutes and then someone else would come up for three minutes and share. And there were two people who came up and they shared how abortion is illegal in their country. 
but that just meant that there weren't surgical abortions. The ladies were, you know, the postal service would provide abortion pills, and the that was how the abortions were performed. And so there was, uh, and there wasn't really the infrastructure to support. It, long story short, is as it is abortion with, with these examples of well, they were third world countries. The abortion being illegal, the abortion pill is used as the mechanism, and so. If, if our, our laws continue to become more pro-life, the abortion pill may end up um, becoming more prevalent, and in which case the abortion pill reversal becomes an answer to that growing future problem. But if abortion becomes illegal or unthinkable... If it becomes unthinkable, then, then yeah. The abortion pill then would be illegal. Yes. Would you think But it also can be shipped. I mean, it's right. it's a yeah. It, it you know it's it, it can be fit in the bottle. Yeah. So, so if it's not illegal in Canada, you can order it from Canada, and Canada would ship to the U.S. Yeah, and the countries like with that Heartbeat International, you know, essentially with the countries where it is illegal, it that what their testimony said was that the abortion pill is used because it can easily be shipped in, and then distributed. Um, it's an illegal drug that you know can be shipped. Um, and so I would say, it, 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 with one of our clients in California, they started offering this service in November, and then by February they had their sixth abortion pill reversal client. And so they had a lot of people, you know, six within three months, um, uh, start the treatment process. And so, of course, that's also the same client that has 2.2 million people within that 15 mile radius of their four locations. So. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how well that applies maybe to the rural area unless, you know, unless there's, I think, so I would say the awareness needs to be there. So if people are taking abortion pills, they need to know that they can change their mind and they need to talk to you, the experts on the abortion pill reversal. Planned Parenthood will call this junk science. Dr. Delgado with abortion pill reversal says it's not junk science, it's new science. They're, they had their, their first journal entry Medical Journal uh, published a few years back with only four cases. They're working to get their second journal published in a medical, uh, a second article published in a medical journal with 200 cases. That's currently going on. Um, they do have an e-letter for, for centers or for center directors. They have an e-letter for uh, medical staff and then a third for individuals slash supporters. Um, and if you're interested in signing up for any one of those, we have a sign-up sheet at our booth. And I would encourage you to get on that. Essentially, it's a very new e-letter. We're doing about one per month. And it's worthwhile to, as new developments are being sent out, we're essentially trying to share them with the goal that people will um, write, con you know, I think centers need to write content about APR to share with their supporters and with their potential clients so that people know that it exists, so they can provide word of mouth. Essentially, APR needs awareness. I think only about half of the centers that I've talked to in the, this year knew that it existed. Um, and I would say a much smaller number are connected. Um, and uh, so, it's also, so there's, a, there's a pregnancy center network. So when someone calls their hotline, it's good to be connected to their center network so that you can be on the recipient call list of, okay, you're in that area. I mean, here's, here's someone on our network that's you know, only 30 miles away. So it'd be really good to have your center on their center network list. And then if you, if you don't know of a doctor or nurse practitioner in your area that's currently connected with APR, it would be really good to establish that relationship now before you have a fire. I mean, it's good to get the bucket full of water before the fire shows up. Because essentially, there's only a 72 hour window to start the process of reversing the abortion pill. Um, and very often, when someone shows up in your counseling room and they want to reverse it, then all of a sudden now we have to get it done right away. And you know, the, the, the clock's already ticking. It's best that they can start the treatment as soon as possible. And it'd be nice not to have to work through the admin part of connecting with a doctor or a nurse and getting them to agree to uh, prescribe, administer, and have that. Um, Having, having it shipped in if it's not already there. Um, and um, yeah, so any questions about APR? Any thoughts, comments? Um, 
If, you're, if the nurse or doctor on your team is hesitant, I would encourage them to reach out to APR and maybe have their, an their questions answered or try to explore how this can fit within your uh, center's medical plan. Um, and um, I, think, I think essentially I would, this, the pregnancy center, my, my vision for it is that the pregnancy centers um, are all aware of APR. Um, and essentially that everyone knows that it exists and what it is. And then for the general public to become aware so that just as aware as they are of the abortion pill. So then when someone thinks, you know, you know, thinking about the abortion pill, they know that there's the reversal process is there and it, only, it has a 65% uh, success rate. Not that that should help ever encourage someone to take the abortion pill, but when someone changes their mind because they just took it and now they wish they didn't, they can, they can act on that or provide that referral saying, oh, you just took it. Well, are you sure you wanted to? Have you thought about reversing that? I mean, obviously, it's, we have to simply speak to where someone is. Um, all right, so I think we have, is it 10 more minutes of time? <coughs> okay. Um, questions, comments, anyone have marketing ideas that they'd like to share with the group? Anyone try anything new lately? And it worked or didn't work? <laughs> because I use my personal account and then link it to our center account and then so my friends get to be in that sphere and so we're impacting more uh, men and women through the population account. Okay. So, um, when it comes to like vehicles, like I would, I, I sure of, I call marketing things vehicles, like um, like Facebook uh, or a website, um, Instagram pages. I, I look at these as being different vehicles, a, a way of providing a message to somebody. Um, and I sort of one of the things I strongly believe is that you should have one vehicle per audience. So like you should have one Facebook page for abortion-minded clients, one website for abortion-minded clients. You should have a different uh, vehicle for the life-minded community to raise support with a different call to action, different message. And, you know, again, the, the Facebook vehicle for that same audience. Um, and ideally, I think it would be ideal if um, each, uh, you know, if you had a different name, one name for client marketing and a different name for donor marketing. However, we all were, you know, I'm not in your boardroom 35 years ago when the name, the name decision was taking place, so we are where we are today. So we could use, very often we'll see people using um, the center's name for client marketing, fully spelled out, <coughs> and we might use the initials, you know, ABC or CPC or whatever it might be, um, using the initials for the donor marketing. So when someone Googles the initials, the donor marketing may show up, and then the full spelling would bring up the client marketing. Um, however, it'd be really great if this, you know, they had, we had different names, but based on the fact that a lot of centers don't have different names, we have to work with where we are. Um, so out of curiosity, who in here knows um, who owns Quaker Oats? Nope. I know. Who owns Pepsi, that's right. <laughs> did I tell you that one before? No. Oh, you knew it. Did. Oh, nice. <laughs> so PepsiCo owns Quaker Oats. So Quaker Oats is heart healthy. You're actually the first person to get that right. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, Quaker Oats is heart healthy. They're, and then Pepsi is sugary fun for the youth, right? <laughs> so they're on opposite sides of a health spectrum. And essentially what I love about that analogy is that they each have a different brand name. You don't see Pepsi and Quaker Oats name together ever. You see Quaker Oats marketed independently of PepsiCo. However, you'll see PepsiCo marketed right next to Taco Bell, which they also own, right next to Lay's Potato Chips, which they own, and usually in the same mile as Gatorade, which they own, <coughs> but not with Quaker Oats. Um, so essentially that spectrum is a good analogy of like 
we're, we're trying to connect with people who are um, religiously and morally pro-life. And they're trying to do God's will. And we're trying to reach out to a woman who is, she may not be a fan of abortion, but she is using abortion because of the scenario that she is currently in. As, or maybe, and essentially, it's, she's not happy, but that's what she's, she's, yeah, she's deciding to use this. And so we have, like, we have this, it's not exactly extremes, you know, it's not an extreme, but it's, they're on opposite sides of a spectrum, just like one is healthy and heart healthy food, and the other one is sugary fun for the youth kind of soft drink. Um, and so I, that's sort of my premise for having one brand per position slash audience. So like having one brand per audience, I think is key. Mm-hmm. However, that's more of a 10 year plan. I think, you know, I would say using the initials for the donor marketing and using the full spelling for the client marketing, something that can be done today. But when the naming decision comes up, there needs to be a lot of strategic planning on naming work. Um, and there's plenty of, there's, there's some really good books that help when it comes to naming, um, when it comes to strategic planning for naming. So are we almost out of time? That was my filler about piece. Five minutes. Oh, if you, five if you minutes. Actually, about six minutes. Okay. If you want it, need it. Um, let's see. Um, How about these questions? <laughs> <laughs> sure, why not? Let's do it. <laughs> um, let's see. That is just the eye option, right? Yeah. Let's see. How many? 120,000 per year. So we, we set up 14 sure. so far. Yeah. Uh, how can a pregnancy center with a small budget make it excellent? So, so uh, actually, let me hold off on that for a minute. Um, so my, my goal with the, this presentation was not to make it into a sales pitch. And so I'm trying to, I try to avoid doing our rapture stuff in here. Okay. So maybe let's do it at the booth. Because I, I always try and like honor Marsha by not doing any rapture stuff as best as best oh. I can. Because <laughs> like whenever I'm in a, whenever I'm on your seat, I always sort of like, if the guy up here is doing a sales pitch, I feel like, ugh. <laughs> so I try and avoid that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I prefer just to educate more so than pitch. Okay, so if you had one suggestion for the. PRC agency pro life entity that's either just starting out or has no marketing budget. Oh, okay. What would it be? Um, tell the vendors that you want that you need to donate their time. <laughs> I hate it when people ask me for a free adoption. So, like, what? Like that's what you have to. You know, you, if you have no budget, yeah, no. then just tell people I really need you to obey God's will and. <laughs> So like, so people that are in this movement, um, yeah, most of us aren't in the movement for the money. <laughs> so just tell us that you need a donation. I, I mean, that's what, you know, it's, it's just a lot. It, the coolest, um, Heartbeat had this um, theme two or three years ago. It's called the superhero theme. It was the coolest theme. Essentially, it portrayed each, um, like the executive director, the, the nurse, the client advocate as different superhero models and like sort of how... If you think about it, you know, the people on your team are saving a lot more lives than Spider-Man ever does. You know, and he's fictional. <laughs> you know, but literally, like, the quantity of lives saved is incredible. And the pregnancy centers are, you know, it's, it's heroic work. And, you know, you're, you're essentially saving lives. It's like there's a burning building and you just want one more person to come in with you to get more people out. I mean, it's, so just ask them. If you don't have the money, just ask. And just tell them that you can be a superhero. And then <laughs> so ego is your one <laughs> Just, yeah, keep asking until they say yes. <laughs> one of the questions I had is we know that all across this planet there are believers who are very adamantly pro-life. And I'll bet you a huge percentage of those people have no idea how to get involved, particularly if they're not near a pregnancy resource center or an adoption Somehow we need to reach those people who would see something and go, I want to support that. Even though I live, you know, wherever. Uh, wow, how do you do that? I don't even know how you start that. Is it, would it be one of these geographical sort of So, things? yeah, you could use marketing to try and bring that awareness. Or you could, I mean, in the end, 
you have to talk to someone. I mean, every one of your donors, your board members, your team members, whenever you talk to someone, that's gonna be impactful. I mean, spending time, making eye contact, body language, having the fruit of the spirit involved. Um, it, it, you have to, you know, an, an ad on Facebook doesn't impact me, yeah. but a conversation with someone that's 10 minutes plus does. But making that awareness thing and getting people hope that there is a way they can help. Yeah. Even if they're far removed from, you know, a big city or whatever. I think when you were talking about kind of like simplifying, like I, I guess that's how I got out of it. Like when you're trying to reach those outside people, like kind of giving it more of a broad um, statement of like we help, you know, mothers yeah. versus, you know, you know that I, that might help a little bit. So you want to start where they are and just simply come to like the next step. We don't want to go, to, like if you try and go up a flight of stairs, you might be able to, you know, if I was really going to run and jump, I could take four steps, right? But I'm going to fall if I try and go to five. <laughs> so you want to, if, if you take one step at a time, it's easy. You simply, you know, have a conversation and you have another conversation and you, you sort of elevate it over time and it, it requires time. You can't just like all of a sudden get someone says, if you want to get to the second floor of this hotel, it's a lot better to take the time to take one step at a time where compared to trying to just, you know, you're not gonna make it to the floor too unless you take the steps. So I would just say take the steps um, and spend lots of time with people talking. Um, but yeah, it, it's, yeah how, do you, how do you get someone to be inspired and passionate about something? And I think time is a major ingredient in that. And, and there's no shortcut to spending, you know, investing time in people. So I think we're out of time. Um, I would enjoy talking, well, all the vendors would enjoy talking with you at the booth. <laughs> and um, so, yeah. And I, let me make a pitch here. First off, let's give Jacob a hand. <laughs> Besides filling out your evaluation forms, I would suggest that this window that you have now from 2.45 till 6.30, which dinner is on your own, this is the time where you can really spend some time with people like Jacob at their booth because this is an important time, I think, for these vendors because now it's relaxed. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to be somewhere. Uh, take some time. Pick up some literature and get some email contacts. And, uh, yeah. All right. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Sure. Oh, and if anyone would like a copy, I made a video slash audio, and I can email you a copy if anyone wants one. It's just I need your email address, and I need to know. Yeah, stop by his booth. <coughs> Sure. Just make a note, please. <coughs> Thank you for coming. Shut this off. Cool.